Yeah. I grew up in a small town in South Carolina, Hartsville, which is about 70 miles or so northeast of Columbia, the state capital. So I went to Talladega College, which is an historic uh, black college. So I went there in 1960, graduated in 1964, and then I served in the Air Force for a little bit better than four years. And after that, I went to Washington University in St. Louis to get my PhD in psychology. And I knew the South. Uh, as a product of the South, I knew the South. John Henry driving on the right hand side, steel drill driving on the left. Before I would let your steam drill beat me down, I would drive my boat, self to death, Lord, Lord, drive my boat, self to death. I didn't really know anything about epidemiology at all. That was not my, my formal uh, training. Um, but um, it turned out that that was exactly what I was looking for, but didn't know that I was looking for it in, in quite that way. And um, it was just so intriguing, so intriguing a discipline. It's, it spoke to my interest in, in working with scholars from other disciplines and using an interdisciplinary scientific framework to address uh, you know, key issues. I was, you know, fairly involved uh, as, a, as a student uh, activist in the civil rights movement, as a college student, and that really formed my, my world view, and it made a deep impression about what I thought I should do with my life. And so psychology, as a, as a discipline, spoke to that a little bit, but it didn't speak to that in quite the deep and broad way that I think I was hungering for. So when I met John Castle, who was a world-renowned uh, epidemiologist. I didn't know it at the time. And as part of our conversation, there was one phrase that he said that really stood out. This field would be an opportunity for me to, to bring together my, my, my interest in social justice and my interest in science, so that this is really where science and social justice come together. And a light bulb went off in my head when he said that. It was a way for them to sort of really think about the work that they were doing as physicians in a broader context, in a context that took into account the role of social factors, cultural factors, political factors, so that they could be better doctors. And so I, 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 I think then that that's directly connected in a way with what was going on in, in South Africa. They work at the Palola Health Center. How do you understand how all of these systemic forces impact the individual patient, impact the group of people who are exposed to the same kinds of forces that shape and constrain their lives? Now, what is your role as a healer? What is your role as a doctor? Given all of that, what do you do? Reflecting on how deeply invested John Castle was to exposing these clinicians to these ideas about culture and about stress and about social stressors and how that compromised the health of people so that when they interacted with their patients they knew what questions to ask they knew how to think about who, who they were and what they were dealing with um, and at the time I don't think that medical schools were doing that sort of work the Jim Crow South was something that the South African emigres, these physicians, could understand and relate to. And I think that manifested itself most clearly in my own case uh, by how Castle immediately kind of zeroed in on what he knew was my own, my own history and, and spoke to me in a way that, that helped me to see possibilities, you know, what I could do. And I think that was really quite deliberate on his part. I don't know that I would have had that kind of conversation with a white U.S. born chairman of the Department of Epidemiology. I can't imagine that the same conversation would have occurred. I don't think that Cecil Sloan would have reached out to me in the way that he did and to become a friend had he not understood in ways that, from my point of view, very few other people did. The, the Jewish heritage, 
of this particular group um, influence the way that they engage their work. I don't remember having an, an explicit conversation with any of them about this, but I believe in my bones that that had a tremendous influence on the way that they carried out their work. After all, John Castle said to me, this is where social justice and science come together. Who talks like that? Who talks like that? Not everybody talks like that. I undertook a research project whereby we worked with vital statistics data for the state of North Carolina and some socioeconomic data that we got from the census. We brought those two data sources together and, and wrote a paper that sort of described how variations in cardiovascular disease mortality, particularly stroke mortality across the 100 counties of North Carolina, were a function of differences in what we call socioecological stress economic impoverishment, a lot of sort of social instability. In the process of doing that research and really having to think really very hard about those issues and then writing a paper, you know, using epidemiological concepts and assumptions um, and getting it published, that was my first paper, you know, that was sort of how I really began to move forward and began to uh, really think of myself at that point. Uh, I'm still pretty early on, but I began to think of myself at that point less as a psychologist and really more as a social epidemiologist. And as a social epidemiologist, I'm interested in the, uh, the contribution really of social and psychological, cultural and economic factors to the health of populations and to disparities in health among various subgroups within a given population. For example, African Americans compared to whites or Latinos compared to, to whites and the stress that African Americans um, have to deal with and have had to deal with really since the very beginning, you know, flow from political and economic oppression, from social exclusion, from just not having the resources really to live life in, in a healthy way. So what are some of the social and economic and psychological and cultural factors that sort of help to explain the persistence of these health gaps uh, between um, segments of, of the population? Gaps that really should not exist, gaps that need to be better understood. There's this notion of a, of a of generalized susceptibility to disease. That is to say, social and economic and indeed political conditions can be so oppressive that they can make populations that are exposed to these multiple forms of oppression, these interacting forms of oppression, susceptible to a variety of things, not just one thing, but that, they're, that all of their physiological systems can be compromised so that whatever is their genetic makeup, a genetic, genetic predisposition, Achilles' heel, if you will, for a particular thing. Whatever it is, it's going to become manifest, but not just in one thing. It could, be, it could manifest itself in multiple diseases as a function of how stressful life conditions related to, to race or to social class can just make you susceptible, can make your entire system susceptible to premature disease and death. Today we call that allostatic load. One of the things I enjoy the most is visiting with people in my own studies, in their homes, and getting and learning their stories. And I and I dare say that that probably goes back to my relationship with Cecil. What I learned from him about how you actually do that. In my own work, I have tried to combine what we today we would call you know a qualitative approach to research with a quantitative approach to research. I want to hear people's stories. And, and, and Cecil taught me the importance of giving people the opportunity to talk about themselves as a way of building that relationship. And then you can go on and ask about the things that you, you, know, you have to ask for, you know, for research accountability purposes. I wanted to have the intellectual tradition that John Castle represented, I wanted to be able to you know, model my intellectual agenda like he was doing, but also wanted to 
I wanted to engage people. You know, I wanted to make that human connection. And maybe that had something to do also with, you know, my former training as a psychologist, which, you know, that is all about that in a sense, right? But it had a lot to do with the fact that I'm a black southerner, and I didn't want my own intellectual agenda to be defined solely in terms of quantitative research, you know, numbers. And I didn't want to talk about black folks as if they were these two-dimensional figures, <laughs> you know, I wanted to talk about them in a fuller, richer, more holistic way. Last words I heard that poor boy say, give me a cool drink of water before I die. Give me a cool drink of water before I die. Give me a cool drink of water. If you will, what John Henryism is about, you know, it makes reference to John Henry, the steel driving man, uh, which according to some versions of the legend of John Henry, he was a uh, a recently emancipated uh, slave and a railroad worker involved in, the trans in building the transcontinental railroad going from east to west. And so along came the, the, the machine, threatened to do the work of human beings and therefore displace the unskilled manual laborers such as he, and he would have none of that. <laughs> so he <laughs> accepted the invitation, shall we say, invitation by the uh, supervisor of the work gang to engage in a, an epic steel driving contest against the machine to see who was better, man or machine. The outcome was, of that contest was obviously pretty important. So he drew upon all of his resources, physical, emotional, psychological, to take on the machine. And he won after hours, according to the legend of this competition. He won, but he dropped dead immediately afterwards from physical complete physical and mental exhaustion. So he won, but he paid a very heavy price. I met a black farmer whose name was John Henry Martin, whose life story, it seemed to me, was a powerful echo of the legend of John Henry. And he paid a price for overcoming the machine that he was faced with, which was the sharecropping system. That was the machine that John Henry Martin, the one that I knew, confronted. And he paid a heavy price, having overcome poverty, having overcome really another form of economic slavery, to become a more economically secure man, a property owner, if you will. And as I listened to his story, it dawned on me that his story was a story of a whole people. It was a story of my people, of black folks in the South. He was, his, his life story was emblematic of that larger struggle. Just as the legend of John Henry was emblematic of that struggle, the constant threat of things changing so quickly that you can't keep up. And in the case of African Americans, particularly working class African Americans, that ever present threat of technologically induced unemployment. And all the economic and psychological insecurity that attends being caught up in what I call the John Henryism situation. And so the theory is that a lot of black folks, a lot of African Americans, particularly poor and working class African Americans, are caught up in a John Henryism situation and their struggle to deal with these endemic forces of marginalization. And it's important for me to emphasize that they are not passive in the face of this. They are struggling to make ends meet. They're struggling to live lives, live their lives with dignity. Parenthetically, this is why I wanted to hear the stories because I knew that the struggle was really about preserving their dignity as human beings. I came up with something that was kind of new and different, but that resonated with ideas that were already in the environment. So there was an intellectual framework in the department wherein these constructs, they weren't specifically focused on African Americans, at least not the way that I sort of began to articulate them, but there was this, this intellectual environment that didn't, within which the, the idea of John Hinduism was not some sort of alien concept. It resonated with something else that was already there in the work of Castle and Tyroler. 
and maybe in particular the work that they did in Western North Carolina when they were looking at what happens to first generation factory workers. Why is it that they have all of these health problems that can be attributed to the fact that they were undergoing this rapid socio-cultural change? What happens when long-standing cultural and economic systems become transformed quickly so that people don't have a chance to adapt? And so they become susceptible to a variety of illnesses. And then in the second generation, after a paradigm for coping with these, the new circumstance has been established, then subsequent generations, assuming some degree of stability, don't suffer the same way. If one were to, if you will, reduce John Castle's contribution to epidemiology to the Evans County study and to the study of factory workers in Western North Carolina, I think that would be to greatly shortchange him. He is most often cited for bringing to the fore the notion that human vulnerability to disease is a function of the social conditions in which people live. So if African Americans then have been subjected to these forces of rapid social cultural change and do not have the resources to cope adequately with that rapid social cultural change, they're going to be susceptible and they're going to be chronically susceptible for generations. And so I was at Chapel Hill, was in a place where I could present this idea to colleagues, have a lot of people kind of nod their heads, you know, well, that's, well, that's kind of interesting, why don't you go for that, right? So encouragement. And that encouragement came, I think, because it was a place where what I wanted to do in terms of John Henry's resonated enough with sort of the intellectual paradigm or paradigms that were there decades before I arrived, that there was a kind of a synergy that enabled me to do the work. If you think about it, the determination, the tenacity, the belief in yourself, the determination to overcome forces that appear to be stronger than you, all of those things are embedded in the legend of John Henry. And the message that is embedded in that legend is and it's a message directed toward working class black people first and foremost is, don't give up on your dreams. Don't give up. Even if you pay a price. Even if you have to pay a price. Because if you don't give up and you, you move the ball just a little bit further down the road, then the next generation is not going to have it so hard. So at the end of the day, it's worth the sacrifice that you're making. That's the lesson. And that was what I knew in my bones from having grown up in a working class black family in the South. I knew that in my bones. What a boy love to hear him sing But most of all that the paymaster loved He just loved to get John in his hammer ring He just loved to get John in his hammer ring He just loved to get John in his hammer ring Lord, Lord, loved to get John in his hammer ring They catch John Henry on a mountain Upon a mountain so high Last words I heard that poor boy say, Give me a cool drink of water before I die. Give me a cool drink of water before I die. Give me a cool drink of water before I die. Well, they kept on in his body to the White House. And they laid it in the sand. Every time a locomotive fellas go rolling by, they say, Yonder lays a speed driving man. Well, now, yonder lays a speed driving man. They say, yonder lays a speed driving man. Yonder lays a speed driving man.